first day I was born You've had your eyes set on me Keeping me safe in your love All of my days I will sing joyfully Lord, you are good to me Always so good to me darkest nights and removing the doubt and the fear Lord you are good to me always so good to me Lord you are good to me always so good to me All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, and also my translation of that verse, you should have uh, open to uh, Daniel eleven forty. 40, my translation of that chapter uh, in front of you, along with your Bibles open to Daniel eleven forty. 40. Uh, we're going to, we have only two more classes left in Daniel chapter 11, and then we st uh, start uh, our study of Daniel chapter 12 on Thursday before we, remember we have no, uh, our final class before the summer break is uh, this Thursday, and then next, uh, you see, oh, oh, I'm going to say, I thought this thing was, uh, we have, um, we have, uh, our last class is next Thursday, uh, this Thursday, this Thursday is our last class, and then we have our summer break, 
and we don't resume classes until Sunday, August 17th. So all the classes and the weekday classes and also Sundays, August 3rd and 10th, uh, we're, uh, will be uh, no classes. So we, our, we, our last class this Thursday, and then we resume classes Sunday, December, uh, Sunday. Uh, Sunday, August 17th, I almost said December. So uh, keep that on your, uh, your schedule. There's a, it's on our website too, Titus put that up there for me uh, for this class schedule in the next couple of weeks. Also, if everyone could keep in, I know the Thompsons are doing that, keep in pr a prayer. Uh, Tyler Thompson and uh, him and Cheyenne have been uh, working really hard uh, detasseling the last week or so. And uh, Tyler's, Tyler is, uh, I guess, have a sore throat and 101 temperature. So if everybody could keep, uh, I'm going to put a prayer request out on our email list tonight. Uh, pray that he doesn't get uh, too sick and that this is just brief. And uh, because they, Thompson's going on their, their uh, trip vacation uh, a Saturday like I am the, to Washington. So we don't want uh, him to be sick or get everybody else sick on the trip. That would really stink. So uh, if you could keep him in prayer, that would be great. And again, I'll put, I'll put a prayer, prayer request out there for him. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Couldn't hit that mute button. Sorry, guys. So uh, we'll keep him in prayer on that. So hopefully he won't uh, get too sick. Um, so uh, right now, um, I, I have uh, I mentioned this in the past. We're going to, um, after we finish the book of Daniel, which is, our, if, if there's no cancellations, our class, uh, class in Daniel will be October 1st, I believe it is. And then we're going to do, what I'm going to do is, I was telling Titus, I'm going to take a, a month off from uh, take a uh, take a month between the, before the next book. The next book is going to be Second Timothy uh, during the weekday classes. But I think I'm going to take a month, and I, I'm probably going to do a variety of subjects during that time. Uh, I'm probably going to do something on the history of the Bible and also canonicity. I uh, probably do that, and uh, also uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to. Uh, uh, it'll either be on the weekday class. Or it might be just on a Sunday I do this, but I might teach a class on uh, the doctrine of annihilationism that uh, f uh, people, uh, some people believe that when you, you die, they just, you don't, you're no longer existing and there's no such thing as suffering in all of eternity in the lake of fire. So uh, that's a very important subject. So I think I might do that for a Sunday class. I think that might do that, save that for Sunday. And then, um, but I'm thinking of doing definitely for the, the weekday classes for, for about a month or do like, uh, canonicity, uh, how we, you know, how we get, uh, what the Bible, you know, the canon of scripture, uh, inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration, um, also um, the history of the Bible. I've never done that, so I got some stuff on that over the years. So probably, you know, the, the, uh, actually uh, history of the Bible and also like I would say, you know, the history of the English Bible too. It's going to be that's involved too. So I think you'll find that really interesting. Uh, the different translations also through the years and talking about great men like White uh, Whitecliffe and uh, Tyndale and all these guys. So um, I did something when I was at GBC uh, years ago with uh, Rick Cabrick and uh, on that on these on these subjects. So that and also I still I might also do it. There's going to be other subjects involved during that month period. I probably do something on the kingdom of God. Uh, it's it's a work in progress, but I got enough right now where I could put, do a you know probably a week uh, two week study on the kingdom of God, going through the whole scripture. Um, one of the things I want to do is um, give you a couple of a uh, couple of studies, different approaches, how we can go, how the Bible. There's a certain themes that go run throughout scripture, like salvation. So I'm gonna go you know probably go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The promise of uh, Genesis three fifteen, which is the seed plot of the gospel, and how it was developed. You know, Revelation's progressive. Progressive. God gave more and more information about that plan of salvation to man through the prophets of Israel, and then Jesus fulfilled these things. So we're gonna probably do something like that. Or, you know, in the kingdom of God, do scripture and how that's because that's a recurring theme that goes all the way to the end of the book, uh, the Bible. So there's a lot of different ideas I get going on. So by the time I get Back from the from vacation, I'll have it all figured out what how I want to do it. I'm just it's just the case of just me organizing um, what how I how I want to do it. How do I want to approach it? And how long do I want to make it? Because the subject of the kingdom of God could take you know we've talked about it in Daniel, and uh, but uh, you could you could spend easily years talking about the kingdom of God in scripture. So, but I just want to do like an overview kind of sort of thing. I just, I don't want to, you know, I want to kind of cover a lot of ground. So we'll do that. Uh, that's just the uh, coming attractions. Uh, 
So let's take a moment of silent prayer. Let's get underway here. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. I do this because uh, I give people an opportunity to, if they haven't already, to confess their sins. Um, I give them an opportunity to confess their sins. And this uh, recovers the filling of the Spirit and our fellowship with God, which are maintained by our obedience to the Holy Spirit. And he, of course, speaks to us through the Scriptures, which he's inspired. So uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, please do it first, Peter. 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study the book of Daniel. We thank you for this wonderful book that you've given to us and revealing your great plan uh, for planet Earth to establish your kingdom on this earth in bodily form through your son, Jesus Christ, and his millennial kingdom. We thank you for the fact that we're a part of that kingdom and help us to live each life, each, our, each day of our lives in light of the imminency of our deaths or the rapture, whichever comes first, so that we might... Uh, produce good works that are pleasing to you, that we might uh, receive a full reward at the Bema seat and therefore maybe get uh, positions of authority in the millennial kingdom of your son. Uh, we just thank you for saving us through faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in appropriating the death and resurrection, the benefits of the death and resurrection of your son at the moment of our conversion. We uh, just pray, Father, that you would help everyone this evening in the audience to concentrate, to understand what's being taught that help them to make application. We pray, Father, that they would seriously consider the passages and principles we'll be noting here this evening. Uh, we also pray that you would give grace to myself so that I can clearly communicate your word to your people so that they are built up and edified spiritually and you and your son, Jesus Christ, the glorified. We pray that you give Titus uh, Thompson the wisdom with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for his service and the technology that you've given to us. And we thank you for he and his wife and their hospitality. Uh, that you would uh, that they would open their homes up to us, their home up to us. We thank you for them, and we also pray for uh, Tyler Thompson. We just pray for him that you would uh, touch him and heal him, uh, and uh, that he wouldn't have anything serious. That he would uh, have a full recovery and be a lot better tomorrow, and that his temperature would drop so that the Thompsons can have a, a restful and uh, enjoyable vacation without everybody getting sick. And so we just pray, Father, for that uh, situation with Tyler. So. Uh, we pray for all these people and things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Should we have Daniel chapter 11, verse 40? And I'm reading from my translation. I'm going to read all the way through verse 44. Verse 44 is our subject this evening. It says in Daniel 11:40. now during the end time, the end time referring to the last three and a half years of the 70th week, uh, which begins with the Antichrist uh, desecrating the temple and the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, in the future, uh, it ends with the second advent of Christ. So now during the end time, the king ruling the south, that's Egypt as we saw, will cause himself to go to war against him. That's the Antichrist who's described in verses 36 through 39. Also the king ruling the north, that's Syria, uh, because uh, we, as we pointed out, this, uh, the Seleucid Empire, which was located directly to the north of Israel and what is now known as Syria, uh, was... Uh, is the king of the north throughout verses 2 through 35. And so therefore, that's who's, being, that's who's in view here in verses 40 through 45. So also the king ruling the north, Syria, and her allies, we could say, will cause himself to storm against him with a military chariot group, with a cavalry as well as a large armada of ships. So by land and sea, they're going to attack Antichrist. However, despite this, he will wage attacks against countries so that he will overflow, yes, pass through like a flood. Verse 40 is a summary, uh, and which is developed in verses 41 through 45, as we pointed out. Now, uh, remember the timing of the attacks here. Uh, the reason why Egypt and Syria will attack the Antichrist is because he's occupying Israel, and when he occupies it, when he, when he, breaks the uh, when he goes in and desecrates the temple and de deifies himself, and then demands the world worship him, and uh, his, then he occupies Israel. After doing this, immediately after doing this, he occupies Israel. Uh, he is going to, this is going to prompt the attack from Egypt 
and Syria, and also the armies from the Far East like China, which we're going to note here this evening in verse 44, which I think you will find very interesting. And uh, so we see that because of his actions in desecrating the temple, uh, that's going to result in this war breaking out. So uh, he's in Israel to start with because he made a treaty with them. That's what started the 70th week, and this was to protect them. Uh, it's unlike uh, uh, people like uh, certain commentators, great men of God have said that Antichrist will come from Europe and, def and de defend Israel because of that treaty, but I don't buy that at all because... Uh, it, uh, because it, the attack and because of Israel being attacked by uh, Egypt and uh, and and, and uh, Russia, that's not the case. It says the Antichrist will be attacked, uh, not Israel. And I, some say, well, it, the attack on uh, Israel is an attack on Antichrist. I, that's not what the text says. The text is saying that they're going to attack Antichrist. So the reason why they're going to attack him is because of his actions in the temple. So, in fact, Jesus, as we saw him in Matthew 24 in, the, in his uh, Olivet Discourse, makes that clear. We pointed that out. Because of that abomination of desolation in the temple, that's going to prompt the great tribulation, the, the war to all, and end all wars to take place, the Armageddon campaign. So that's the, that's the, this is the timing of the attacks here. So all of this is the result of Antichrist deifying himself and then demanding the world to worship him. And then as a result of doing that, right after doing that, he occupies Israel. So his armies are in the Middle East, and everybody considers that a threat, uh, not to mention the fact that he wants the world to worship him or he's demanding people worship him. Otherwise, they'll die. So this is the this is starts the whole war off. So then it says in verse forty one, he will even wage an attack against the beautiful land, a designation for Israel. Indeed, many will be defeated. However, these will, for their own benefit, escape Edom as well as Moab, and in addition, the leadership of the citizens of Ammon. Uh, that is referring to uh, Edom, Moab, and the the uh, and Ammon, the leadership of the citizens of Ammon. That's referring, as we saw, to the what we know today as the kingdom of Jordan. So if the kingdom of Jordan stays as presently constituted all the way through the second ad, uh, the 70th week, then this is speaking of uh, the ancient uh, uh, people who now are, uh, lived in a land which is now called Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. And then it says in verse 42, then he will stretch out his hand, meaning exercise his military power against other countries. And the land of Egypt will not escape. He will even be in control over hidden treasures, namely their gold as well as their silver, indeed over all Egypt's valuable commodities. As we saw that most the world doesn't know about this, this, this uh, great wealth in Egypt, but the Antichrist will get control of it. And help, it will help to prop up his, mili his, his economy, his one world economy. It's also going to help him buy off people, politicians, um, and probably media people. He's going to use that money to advance his kingdom. Verse 40, then it says also at the end of verse 43 in the adjunctive clause, the Libyans as well as the Cushites will be under his control. Remember, the, uh, the, the Libyans are to the west, directly west, their neighbor, uh, Egypt, directly to the west of Egypt is Libya, so they're neighbors, and so they're going to fall to the Antichrist, and the Cushites would be the people we call, uh, that live in Sudan and northern Africa, and also Ethiopia, so that's the designation for Cushites, it's referring to those two nations that we know of today, and probably maybe a couple others, there are African nations down there in that area. So now look at verse 44, however, reports from the east, as well as the north, will alarm him. Who's that? The Antichrist. Consequently, he will march out in a great rage in order to kill, yes, annihilate many. Now, in the New American Standard, verse 44 is translated as follows, uh, not much different from mine. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with, a great, with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. So you notice it's pretty close. Now, but when it says the very first statement, Rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him. That's what we call an adversative clause because it stands in contrast, this statement, to the previous prophetic statement, uh, statements in verses 41 through 43. Thus, the contrast is between many nations falling to the Antichrist, this wicked king that's mentioned in verses 36 through 39, and the armies from the east and the north challenging. So this is saying... Okay, despite the fact that he's attacking these countries like Egypt, Libya, and Kush, uh, the Kushites, Ethiopia, Sudan, are falling to him in Israel, 
there's going to be a challenge. So this adversative cause enters in, uh, brings into the picture some armies that are going to challenge the Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. The word for rumors is sh uh, shumwa, which means uh, report news pertaining to information, whether positive uh, or negative, uh, the, the, whether positive or negative, often from another geographical area, which is announced to others. So again, uh, this word, shumwa, which means report, it's rumors or, or news reports. It pertains to information, whether positive or negative, often from another geographical area, which is announced to others. So here, that would mean, this word translated rumors, means that the wicked king, described in verses 36 to 39, will hear intelligence reports from his military observers who will inform him that the armies from the east and the north are mobilizing against his armies. And you could even say, uh, today, I think it would, with all the media in the world today, uh, it's going to be easy to see armies take, getting ready to move and mobilizing and ready to attack a lot, a lot more than today, uh, than, let's say, uh, back in the the early '60s, like when the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on, our army, our our military was mobilizing, and they were all going down to Florida, and there was, you know, uh, tra train loads of guys going down there, and they had a million man army ready for an invasion of Cuba, and so they could see that. But today, you couldn't you couldn't keep that secret today. The media would get all over it and say, "Oh, look, there's about to be a, a, an attack here," and so. Uh, that with all the media, you know, it, it, just that in itself will probably get Antichrist this in, information. But I'm sure the, prof the professional military people of his will be telling him exactly what's going on with these with these armies. So then it says in, uh, he will just um, it says, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him. Will disturb is the word behal, uh, behal, excuse me. It means to alarm, to trouble, to disturb. It's correctly translated, of course. It pertains to hearing information which warns the wicked king here of an impending attack from armies coming from two different directions. So as we'll see, Antichrist is going to fight on two fronts, and that's very difficult to do. He's going to fight uh, from the, with the north, people from the north, Syria and her allies, as well as from the east with this massive army that's mentioned actually in Revelation 16, as we'll see this evening, massive army that's going to come across the Euphrates River, which will be dried up by God at that time. It isn't now. So this is going to be quite, uh, this is what's going to make the, uh, uh, the final battle, which uh, culminates in the second advent of Christ, so awesome. So then it says, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. That's presenting the direct consequence of hearing these disturbing news reports or of uh, mobilization of armies from the east and the north. Uh, this phrase, he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many, presents the result of the previous prophetic statement that intelligence reports from the east and the north will alarm the Antichrist. Now, when it says he will go forth, that speaks of marching out uh, to confront an enemy. The word is Yatsa. It means to march out here. And it refers to the armies of, of the, the Antichrist uh, the wicked king described in verses 36 and through 39, marching out of Israel to engage armies coming from the east and the north. So probably uh, face them at the borders or around the territory around Israel. Uh, he is going to deal with these. He's going to confront uh, the armies of the east and the north one on one. He's not going to sit there and play defensive. He's going to be going on the offense against these armies. He's not afraid of them. So probably because he's not afraid of them because he's so talented and has been so successful that he really doesn't, he doesn't think these guys could beat him. So uh, he, may, he may look at it as an opportunity uh, to really do, uh, control the world by taking out these armies. If he can take them out, then he's, he's, he's got the world. If he, can get, if he can knock out China, those great armies from the east, and then Syria and her allies, uh, this would be uh, allow him to consolidate his power base. So the word uh, phrase to destroy indicates that as a result of hearing intelligence reports from the east and the north, that armies were mobilizing against him. This wicked king, uh, the Antichrist, will march out his armies for the purpose of killing many from these armies mobilized against him. When it says to annihilate many, that indicates that as a result of hearing these intelligence reports, from the east and the north, that armies from the east and the north are coming or mobilizing against him, this wicked king, the Antichrist, will march out his armies for the purpose of annihilating many soldiers from these armies. It, this uh, phrase, to destroy and annihilate many, actually contains the figure of Hendiatus, 
which means that the writer uses two words, two verbs, or two nouns, but yet he's using them to mean to emphasize one thing. It mean, the, the figure means one by means of two. So here in verse 44, uh, the phrase to, to annihilate and destroy many, it contains the figure of endiatus, which is emphasizing that the Antichrist's intention of complete, it emphasizes his, his intention of completely destroying the armies of the east and the north. So he is going to be so enraged and so upset that he's going to take on these, these massive armies and he wants to destroy them, annihilate them. He just doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't want to cause them to back up. He wants to wipe these armies off the face of the earth. He's, it's his intention, is expressing his intention to, to, to annihilate these armies, to wipe them out. So here in Daniel 11.44, we have a, a pretty astounding statements being uh, made here by the angel to Daniel. Here in verse 44, the angel's informing Daniel with the, prof the first prophetic statement that reports from the east as well as the north will alarm him. Since we've already established that this king is the Antichrist, this prophetic statement teaches that intelligence reports in the east and the north will alarm him but who are these armies from the east and the north? I mean, we know from the east and the north, but what armies would that be? Well, I'm going to tell you what those armies are this evening. First of all, the army from the east, let's take a look at that. The army from the east would appear to be the armies from the far east, such as China and Japan or Korea. Uh, you could even throw uh, uh, the Vietnam in there, Cambodia. Uh, this is, and the reason why I say this is because it's supported by the prophecies in Revelation 16, which teaches, in particular, Revelation 16, 12, that it, in that passage, it teaches that a massive army of 200 million men will march across the dried up Euphrates River to oppose the Antichrist. Now, this attack against the Antichrist by the armies from the east is the direct result of the sixth bold judgment mentioned in the book of Revelation. So it's uh, the purpose of this sixth bold judgment is to prepare the way for the invasion of, the, of Israel by the kings from the east to do battle with the armies of the Antichrist so that God might bring them into judgment. So though God is not, uh, what God, God is doing here, it's showing his sovereignty over the nations. This sixth bold judgment, which results in these armies coming across the Euphrates River to fight Antichrist, is a part of God's judgment. It's a part of God's plan, this war, because he wants them to be destroyed. In fact, he wants them all in one area because he wants to make a big show of his son destroying, out, destroying all of these tribulational armies, including Antichrist, to show you who's the boss and who's taken over, uh, who has the rightful place to, 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 run, uh, to rule planet Earth, Jesus Christ, the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let's take a, a, a run over to Revelation now. We'll be there for a little bit here. Look at Revelation. Giant, do you have do you have those? Uh, look at this up in here. Those translations I gave you, I might have given you some of my stuff. Did you see anything in there? Yeah, let me see those for a second. Oh, actually, forget it. I got it. Sit right in front of me. This is what happens when you get old. Thank you. Sorry for bothering you. Okay, let's. So we have in Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, verse 44. We, that's what happens when you get old. You should know that. You're right there with me. So here, I'm looking for it. And it's like I didn't recognize it because I didn't think, realize I had this in front of it. It was stapled together. So you don't need to know that. Who cares? So anyways, um, Daniel eleven forty four. it's saying that these, these armies from the east are going to attack Antichrist as a result of his actions. Well, uh, we can compare this with Revelation 16, 12, which actually mentions armies from the far east coming across the king, they're called the kings of the east, kings from the east, coming across the dried up Euphrates River and waging war against the Antichrist. And it's a part of the six-fold judgment. Uh, and this judgment, uh, it, it shows us that this six-fold judgment re reveals the fact that God is sovereign over the nations and that their actions are a part of their, his plan. This war between the Antichrist and these armies from the east and the north, his attack of Israel, 
Egypt is defeat of Egypt, Libya. It's all part of God's sovereign plan. It, nothing is surprising God. It's part of his plan. And ultimately, the gathering of all these armies in the Middle East is, is for their destruction. God's going to destroy them with the second advent of Jesus Christ. I really can't. I've read so much stuff on the, on the second advent of Christ. I really just can't wait to see this thing. This thing is just going to be, un, this is going to be just so magnificent to watch. It's just going to be incredible. And I just, I can't wait to see this thing. This is just an incredible, this is going to be an incredible sight. You know, it's just going to be amazing. And uh, what's going to take place at the second advent with the destruction of all these massive armies. Uh, so look at Revelation 16, 1. Revelation 16, 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Verse 2, so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast who worshipped his image. Uh, this is reminiscent of the, uh, the sixth plague in Egypt, remember, in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. And then the, the second bowl judgment is recorded in verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. And now the, the third bowl judgment is found in verses 4 through 6. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and were, who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So that's the third, uh, we have the third bold judgment there. Now, it's interesting. It's not, uh, it's, it, you know, as people of the devil's world, unregenerate man is the object of God's wrath. The earth itself is a part of God's wrath here. And all the things that man needs to, to sustain life is going to be affected greatly because of God's judgment. I've said this in the past. This world, this is telling us, this world is under the wrath of God. And the only way to escape it, not just physically, but this spirit, this wrath spiritually, in a spiritual sense, is through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're delivered from the wrath to come in the lake of fire. But also, if you're living in the tribulation period, faith in Jesus will deliver you from God's wrath that's coming upon this world because of their rejection of his son, Jesus Christ. So as I said before, we're living in enemy territory right now. And this world expresses its animosity to the Bible and Jesus Christ. Remember, you can't know Jesus Christ unless you know the Bible. The Bible is the living word, of, a written word of God. Jesus is the living word of God. To know God is to know your Bible, what it says. God has expressed himself in the word of God, the Bible, and he wants us to know who he is. And so uh, your, people's attitude toward uh, the Bible and Jesus Christ and Christians who love the Bible and uh, learn it and obey it, uh, there, there's animosity towards them. Uh, and uh, this is, shouldn't be unusual because the devil it doesn't like us because of that. And the devil, because of our relationship to Jesus Christ, so we're his enemies. So we can't expect uh, anything but try. We, we got to expect that we're going to, at times, have trials and tribulations. Of course, God protects us uh, into us. So there are times that He will allow us to go through adversity and undeserved suffering and persecution from the devil's world. But we should rejoice at that because it's an honor and a privilege to suffer for Jesus Christ, as it says in Philippians one twenty nine. And so then it says in verse eight in Revelation sixteen eight, the fourth angel put out his bowl upon the sun. And it was given it, it given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. Now that's, that's pretty awful, that, that bull judgment. That's the fourth bull judgment. The fifth is in verses 10 through 11. Then the fifth angel poured out his bull on the throne of the beast, the Antichrist, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Uh, one of the reasons why God is doing this too, this judgment, is that he might save some of these people. Uh, his, his design ultimately is to save all people, but not all people will change their attitude, repent, and believe in Jesus Christ. These people and part of Antichrist's kingdom are not going to repent. And uh, they're not going to take this 
this judge, this uh, this exercise of God's wrath seriously, or they're going instead of just being humbled by it. Instead, they're going to become more arrogant and oppose God even more. Then it's then we have the sixth bowl judgment, and this is related to the attack uh, from the the, uh, the armies from the east against the Antichrist. Revelation sixteen twelve. The sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river, the Euphrates. And its water was dried up so that the wake would be prepared for the kings from the east. And we'll find out what, who they are. They're, 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 they're the uh, rumors from the east. That's what it's related to in Daniel 11, 44. And it says, I saw, verse 13, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Remember, the dragon is Satan. Uh, the beast is the Antichrist. And the false prophet, of course, promotes the worship of the Antichrist. There's your satanic trinity right there. Verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. Now, again, this six bowl judgment, we have the kings from the east coming across the dried up Euphrates. This is related to Daniel 11:44, where it says rumors from the east will disturb the Antichrist and he'll go out to destroy and annihilate many of these from these armies of the east and the north. So this is Revelation 16, 12 through 16 is related to Daniel eleven forty four because they're both speaking of armies from the uh, same place, armies from the east, the far east. Now the phrase, the, the kings from the east, in the original Greek text of this passage, it literally means the kings from the rising sun. That's exactly what it says. Now, this is a poetical expression signifying the kings or the rulers from where the sun rises, such as Japan, uh, India, China, China, Japan, India, Persia, Afghanistan, all of them. Now, here we have God acting in his sovereignty here. He's, he's expressing his sovereignty. Now, the, uh, with having these armies come across the dried up Euphrates River. Now, the word war there is the word palamos, and it signifies a war in verse 14, if you notice in verse 14, I've mentioned this in the past, but I haven't actually gone to the verse and show you. I might have done, that, done this in the Day of the Lord series. But in verse 14, it says, For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather, to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. You've heard me say that this is not one pitched battle. It's actually a campaign. It's a three-and-a-half-year war. Well, the word war there in verse 14 is the word palamos. It signifies a war, not just one pitched battle. It signifies an entire campaign and not merely one isolated conflict or battle like the Battle of Waterloo or the uh, Battle of, Bo of the Bulge. So then we have the phrase Har-Mageddon. It's the, the na proper name, Har-Mageddon, and it's a transliteration of two Hebrew words, Har and Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo. And the word Megiddo means place of troops or place of slaughter. That's what it means. It's also called the plain of Esdralon and the valley of Jezreel. And this area is about 1,400 miles wide and 20 miles long and forms what Ma Napoleon said when he saw it, is that the most, he says it's the most natural battlefield and the entire earth. This is what Napoleon, when he was in the 1800s, when he went in there into Egypt, and uh, then he went into the Middle East and Israel, and he saw what the Bible describes as this final, where this final battle is going to, uh, the war is going to culminate, really, and this battle, uh, war is going to go uh, rage. He looked at this, this, this area and just said, this is the most perfect battlefield in the face of the earth. So this is what, uh, quite interesting. Um, John Wolverd, makes the following comment. He writes, there has been considerable discussion concerning the meaning of the term Armageddon taken by some to mean Mount of Slaughter. Geographically, it relates to the Mount of Megiddo located adjacent to the plain of Megiddo to the west and the, the large plain of Esdralon to the northeast. Megiddo is the Hebrew word corresponding to the Greek word Armageddon. Now, this area was the scene of many great of the great battles of the Old Testament, such as that of Barak and the Canaanites in Judges 4, and the victory of Gideon over the Midianites in Judges 7. I, I studied that in the past myself, personally. Here also occurred the deaths of Saul and Josiah. The area, though, is, it is, though it is a large one, is not sufficient for the armies of all the world, he says. The, uh, what the scripture seems to indicate is that this area is the central point 
It's very important what he says here. It's the central point for the military conflict which ensues. Actually, the armies are deployed over a 200-mile area up and down from this central location. At the time of the second coming, some of the armies are in Jerusalem itself. You compare that with Zechariah 14, 1 through 3, end of quote. So this, uh, we see here that um, Titus in the past, the armies of uh, uh, in the Roman uh, general Titus, he, he and his Roman army uh, used this place as the natural corridor, and so did the Crusaders in the Middle Ages use this area. And in recent history, the British... Uh, General Allenby in World War II used it, excuse me, World War I, he used it when he defeated the Turkish armies in 1917. So the Battle of Armageddon appears to be, or uh, appears to be the result of the armies of the nations of the earth gathering on their own initiative. That's what it would appear by human, uh, the human mind. And they are going by their own initiative. This is true. However, this is according to God's plan from eternity past. Satan, Antichrist, the false prophet, the satanic trinity, as I mentioned, through demonic powers will influence the nations and cause, uh, and cause them uh, to go to war with each other. So God has actually figured this. What I'm saying is God has figured all their decisions into his plan. This is part of his plan, his divine decree in eternity past. And this prophecy is actually a, is a manifestation of this divine decree in eternity past. If you went, in, and went to God, God could tell you and say, tell you every single event that will ever take place in history, that's taken place in the past, all the way up to the end of this, to the second advent, all the way through the millennium. In fact, he could tell, he, it's like a, you can't even say it's like a computer, but he has, because of his omniscience, he has all this, because he has all this, he has this omniscience, part of his character and nature. He knows all these things before they take place. So he, man makes his decisions, but, God sovereignly decrees for those decisions to take place. Again, the great principle you got to remember, the divine decree says that the sovereign will of God will coexist with the free will of the volition of human beings and angels, you could say, as well. So this war, though they have, they're, making, they're committing all kinds of sins by going to war with each other and doing all kinds of things, it's God's permitting them to make their negative decisions, bad decisions, because he has ultimately something he wants to do with all of this. He wants to destroy all these armies. He wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. So uh, the kings from the east in Revelation 16, 12 is a poetical expression signifying the kings from uh, where the sun rises, such as China, Japan, India, Persia, and Afghanistan. You could throw Korea in there. Uh, you could throw Cambodia, China in there. All these uh, places will be involved in this, this invasion from the east. So therefore, in Daniel eleven forty four, the army from the east, which will oppose the Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week, is the direct result of this six-fold judgment that we read about in Revelation 16. And this army will be composed, this, this great army from the east, will be co composed of China, Japan, India, Persia, Afghanistan, and I mentioned the other, Korea, Cambodia, all those nations. This massive army from the east will oppose Antichrist because of Antichrist's actions and conquering militarily the Middle East and demanding that the world worship him. This is very important to see. Uh, they're going to find him a, th a threat to their interests, and there's going to be a, 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 the power. It, 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 uh, it, it, it messes up the, uh, uh, the powers on the earth. It messes up the, the, the way things are set up. It's going to cause a big shake, geo geopolitical shake in the world, Antichrist actions. They're going to go and you know, attack him, not simply because... He's gone into the Middle East and he's occupying Israel and Egypt and those nations. But because he's also demanding that the world worship him. This is important to see because he seeks to have the world worship. This is astounding that this, there's no leader in the history who's ever attempted this. He will do this. This is in the future. So uh, we've touched on this before in the past. Look at Re uh, Revelation 13. You're in Revelation. Might as well go there. Go to Revelation 13. And look at verse 11, please. So Revelation 13, 11. And in the first 10 verses of this chapter, Revelation 13, we saw the rise of uh, the final stage of the Roman Empire. And then the Antichrist is mentioned. 
uh, after in verses one through three, you have the revived stage of the Roman em- final form of the Roman Empire, the revived form of the Roman Empire, final stage of the Roman Empire being mentioned, prophesied about that beast. There's, then the, the Antichrist, the beast, then starts signifying the Antichrist when we start talking about attributes of personality. That's mentioned in verses uh, five all the way through the end of the chapter. So verse eleven, we have the false prophet who's going to promote the worship of the Antichrist. He kind of mimics the Holy Spirit who promotes the worship of Jesus Christ. So verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in his presence. And he makes the earth, very important, he makes, he compels the earth, you could say, the people of the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It's compulsory uh, it's compulsory. He's compelling the world, ordering the world to worship him, and he's going to enforce it. And it says this. He performs great signs, the false prophet does, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men, which undoubtedly many will worship the, the Antichrist because of this. Then he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. This is why they're going to worship him. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword that had come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the, the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many, many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Remember in, in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said, when you see this happen, that, you know, the statue, the image of the Antichrist, he says, run for the hills. Then the tribulation, it begins. Then he says in verse 16, and look what he says, and he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one be, will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So he'll control the world's economy, he will con- and he will be able to do what he wants to because he controls the world's economy, and uh, he is. Uh, this is going to compel uh, the people around the world. Some of these people are going to retaliate against him. The armies from the east, and of course, the kingdom that's directly to the north of him, Syria and her allies, is going to wage an attack against the Antichrist during this period. So uh, we see that the army, uh, this massive army from the east that's mentioned in Daniel 11.44, will oppose the Antichrist because of his actions in conquering militarily the Middle East and demanding that the world worship him. Now, let's talk about the army from the north now. Let's go back to Daniel, please. Daniel 11.44. If you haven't gone back there already, go to Daniel 11.44. Daniel 11, 44, and I'm reading from my translation. However, reports in the east as well as the north will alarm him, the Antichrist. Consequently, he will march out in a great rage in order to kill, yes, annihilate many. So who's the armies from the reports from the north? Who's the person from the north? Same ones mentioned in verse 40. This is not a sign. Verse 40 is not, uh, Daniel 11, 40 is not describing a simultaneous attack. And I'll explain why. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in stages, this thing. Very important. I'll, I'll explain it to you in a minute. The army from the north, who we, who we know that to be. It's, it's, it's going to be Syria and her allies. And we know that because, is, again, the first reason that we have in, in Titus, uh, Titus, in Daniel chapter 11, verses uh, 5 through 30, uh, from, actually from verses 2 all the way to verse 35, the king of the south has been Egypt, so therefore... In context, verses 40 through 45, the king of the south is Egypt. The king of the north in verses 2 through 35 is Syria. And therefore, in verses 40 through 45, to be consistent hermeneutically, it has to be Syria in verses 40 through 45. Let me repeat that. In verses 2 through 35, the king of the south has been Egypt. And then we get to verses 40 through 45, no problem. It's got to be Egypt. However, when we get to the king of the north, people get all messed up. And great men of God, they start saying, well, the king of the north is, is Russia. Well, the king of the north, to be consistent, if we're going to apply the same principle logic that we did with the king of the south being Egypt, uh, then we have to do that with the king of the north. If The king of the north in verses 2 through 35 has been the Seleucid Empire, which was centrally located in Syria, direct, in what is a place called Syria today. Then in verses 40 through 45, Syria has to be in view again. And I say Syria, but also 
other nations near Syria. Uh, uh, because the Seleucid Empire had, uh, had other geographical locations that they were in control of. It wasn't just what we know today as Syria, but that's where they were centrally located. So the army from the north is more than likely Syria and her allies. In fact, I'll tell you emphatically, it's Syria. And it's not Russia, as I pointed out. Uh, many men, great men of God, think that the king of the north in Daniel 11, 40 through 45 is Russia. And we see that uh, they use uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, those chapters, to support their interpretation. However, that does not fly. As I mentioned in the past, we'll mention it again so you, know, uh, you understand what I'm talking about. So the army from the north is, more, is, is Syria and her allies and is not Russia, which is referred to in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as attacking Israel. Since Ezekiel 38 and 39 makes no mention of an invasion from Egypt, as is the case in Daniel 11, 40, Furthermore, the army invading Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes from the remotest parts of the north of Israel, whereas in Daniel 11:40, the Antichrist is attacked by the army from the north with no mention as to how far north as was the, uh, they were coming from, as was the case in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. So this would suggest that the king of the north in Daniel 11:40 is not the same as the northern ruler who attacks Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, as we noted... The king of the north throughout Daniel chapter 11 is referring to the Seleucid Empire, which was located centrally in the, to the immediate north of Israel, which today it's called Syria. Now, uh, why is it, as I pointed out, why is it that expositors consistently identify the king of the north in verses 5 through 35 of Daniel chapter 11 as being a reference to Syria, but then in Daniel 11.40, they interpret the king of the north as Russia. It's hermeneutically inconsistent to interpret the king of the north this way. And in fact, many of these expositors, as I pointed out, who argue that the king of the north in Daniel 11.40 is Russia, also say that the king of the south in Daniel 11.40 is Egypt, because Egypt has been, has been referred to throughout chapter 11 as the king of the south. So therefore, the identity of the king of the north in Daniel 11.40 should be determined in light of the Seleucid Empire or in others, uh, in, in, or in other words, in light of the fact that throughout Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 35, the king of the north is a reference to this empire, which was located to the immediate north of Israel, which today would be Syria. So today, the national boundaries of the Seleucid Empire would include Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, as well as parts of Pakistan. But that doesn't mean all these nations are going to be a part of this, uh, uh, the king of the north here in Daniel 1140. Um, I don't believe uh, Turkey is, because I believe Turkey is, in, is in, in another, in the Ezekiel invasion, Ezekiel 38 and 39 with Russia. They're going to go in that. But all I'm saying is, at points in, in, in Seleucid Empire's history, they would have what today is we call Syria. They had at, at one time Turkey, the area known as Iraq today, Ar Iran and Afghanistan, as well as parts of Pakistan. I'm not saying all those nations are going to be involved in this with the king of the north here. Some of these will be, undoubtedly. So therefore, we should interpret the king of the north in Daniel 11.40 as a confederation of nations located geographically to the immediate north of Israel. Thus, during the last three and a half years of the 70th week, both Egypt and her allies in her, in her region, as well as Syria and her allies, will attack the Antichrist. Now, I want to go to Ezekiel 38. Go over there. The king of the north in Daniel 11.44 Back through verses 40 through 45 of Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north is emphatically not Russia, which has been uh, said by many. Look at Ezekiel 38. And I'm going to show you why, because for this, I'll show you how, how I'm going to show you is this. And I showed it this to you, I think, showed it to you on, when we did verse 40. Um, I'm going to show you that the, the invasion that's mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is totally different than, the, than the, 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 the attack from the king of the north that's recorded in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. They're, totally, they're describing totally different attacks. In fact, certain nations are omitted, like Egypt in Ezekiel 38 and 39. You, you would think they would be in this being mentioned, because that's a significant nation, but they're not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's a, a glaring omission. Now, it says, uh, in, it says in, uh, in Ezekiel 38, Verse 1, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. The, all those names are related to people who are in a, located in a place that's now called Russia and uh, 
Ukraine, Georgia, all those nations we hear about in the news today, that's who it's referring to. And then it says in verse 3, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Persia, that would be Iran, Ethiopia, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, bed from the remote parts of the north with all its troops and many peoples with you. In Daniel 11, 40 through 45, there's no mention how far north. That's significant. And this is mentioned throughout the chat. Uh, this is mentioned two other places. Uh, I think in Ezekiel 39, it mentions this uh, in, uh, in verse Ezekiel 39, uh, 2. It says, and I will turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Again, how far north? The remotest parts of the north. And those names, ancient names in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, were located to the extreme north of, of, of Israel. They were what we today know as Russia, Ukraine, those nations. So that's, that's significant. So this couldn't be the same people. Uh, the, this, they couldn't be, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 cannot be used as support for the king of the north being Russia in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. Now it's another thing. Look at, this is quite interesting. Look at verse 7, Ezekiel 38, 7. Ezekiel 38, 7. Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companions that are assembled about you, and be a, be a guard for them. After many days, you will be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into the land, look what it says, that is restored from the sword, war, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. That's exactly what's happened today in the last 50 years. Israel was brought from many nations. The people, they became a nation in 1948. The Jews have been flocking to, around the world, have been flocking back to Israel, their homeland. And this place is, used to be a continual waste. It's not a waste if you go over there today. It's budding like a rose. They've grown, they're, 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 they're one of the greatest exporters of fruit in the world today. And nobody else in the Middle East can grow anything, but Israel can. So then it goes on to say, but its people were brought out from the nations. And look what it says. This is very important. And they're living securely, all of them. It's saying the Jews will be at peace and secure. Now, I read Daniel 11, 40 through 45. Israel's at war throughout that whole passage. So how could this invasion from the north in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, how can it be from Russia and her allies? It's from Syria and her allies. So... And what's interesting, over the last, since World War II, Syria and, is and Russia have been allied with each other for a long time. In fact, they continue to be. So it says, so notice they're living securely, all of them. Well, that's telling us, that's a glaring, that's telling you that this invasion here couldn't possibly be in the, mid, the last three and a half years somewhere of the 70th week. Because that's, that's, there's war, this is, it's war. That's why many people think that this invasion will come somewhere before the, the, the midway point of the 70th week or at the beginning of the 70th week or before the 70th week even takes place. This war could take place. So there's, oh, to tell you the truth, there's so much conjecture. We don't know the timing of this invasion, Ezekiel 38, 39. Students of prophecy, great men of God, there's really no consensus as to where, when, is it just before the 70th week or at the beginning of the 70th week or before the middle of the 70th week when this invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to take place from Russia? There's really no consensus. But now notice who's getting attacked? Israel. But who's attacked? Who's the king of the north attacking in Daniel 11, 42, 45? Antichrist. It's clearly saying that. Israel's being attacked in Ezekiel 38, 39 and at a time of peace. Daniel 11, 40 through 45, Israel's at war with the Antichrist. They've already been conquered by him. So we have the, uh, the Antichrist is not, uh, Ezekiel 38, 39, the object of the, the, the person, the, the, the people who are the victims of this invasion, this is another thing, people who are victims of this invasion are Israel. Antichrist is being attacked in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. So different, the people who are being attacked are different. They couldn't be the same invasions. Daniel 38, Daniel 11, 30, uh, 40 through 45, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 are not describing the same invasion is what I'm telling you. 
And I've said this, I've said that in the past. So let's let me let me go point by point, real quick, summary what I'm talking about here. People say in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, the king of the north is Russia. It's not Russia for the following reasons. First of all, let's look at the context. Daniel 11, 2 through 35, the Seleucid Empire has been the king of the north. They were located in Syria and area, you know, covered the area down to Iran, those nations around there, and Pakistan. Now, it had, therefore, the king of the north has to be Syria, because in verses 40 through 45, because they were, uh, uh, the, the Seleucid Empire was located in uh, north of Israel in a place called Syria. The Seleucid Empire is mentioned in verses 2 through 35. Therefore, they must, the, the, the Syria must be in view here in verses 40 through 45 as the king, uh, 40, verses 40 through 45 as the king of the north. Because the king, the, uh, the, because they've already been, uh, we know that they, verses 2 through 35, it's been the Seleucid Empire and they were located in, in Syria. So we have to be, because people in, in, in verses 2 through 35 say the king of the south is Egypt, and then they say in verses 40 through 45, yeah, it's the king of, king of, it's the, king of the south is Egypt. Why? Well, because that's, they were that way in verses 2 through 35, Egypt was in view. But they don't apply the same logic when it comes to the king of the north. Why? Because Russia's big in the news all the time, and, it's in the, and they were a big part of the Cold War with the United States. So a lot of, a lot, I think a lot of these American expositors of prophecy were a little influenced by that. I'm not saying a lot, but definitely we're influenced by that. And that's one of those things you got to be careful when you study the Bible. People do this all the time. you got to be very wary of it. We like to read in our day and age into the Bible. And we, instead of being objective and looking the facts, and, you know, it, it, we have a tendency to go and try to say, oh, yeah, we're, we're, this is what's going on in our day and age. And we like to, this is, you know, king of the north. It's got to be Russia, you know. But it's not. The text is not saying that. The other thing is, Who's, who's being attacked in Daniel 11, 40 through 45? Antichrist. Not Israel. It says him, Antichrist. Who's being attacked in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Israel. Two different invasions. Now, I know some people say that the, uh, to attack Antichrist, to attack Israel is to attack Antichrist because of the treaty he made with her. But I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I think it's pretty weak. So let's wrap it up here. If you notice in Daniel eleven forty through 45, the angel does not say if the army from the north will be defeated by the Antichrist, but he does say that the army from the south will be defeated, which we noted as a reference to Egypt. The reason for this could be that Syria and her allies will join forces with the armies from the Far East to fight Antichrist during the Armageddon campaign until the second advent of Jesus Christ. So the reason why the king of the north is probably not mentioned as being defeated like the king of the south was, is that Syria, unlike Egypt, will be fighting the Antichrist all the way up to the second advent of Christ, along with these armies from the east like China and Japan and Korea. So the, again, the, uh, in other words, the armies of the final stage of the Roman Empire under Antichrist will be at war with the armies of Syria and the Far East until Jesus Christ's second advent, which will end this war. So Antichrist would be fighting on two fronts during this war of Armageddon, as I noted earlier. Now, we also must remember that the attack from the south and the north against the Antichrist, mentioned in Daniel 1140, will not be a simultaneous attack. I mentioned this earlier, and I said I would explain it to you, and now, as promised, I will. Again, the attack from the south and the north that's mentioned here against the Antichrist in Daniel 1140 will not be a simultaneous attack. Why? Because of the prophetic statements in this verse summarize what's being said in verses 41 through 45. So what I'm telling you is that the army from the north in Syria will, along with the armies from the east, oppose the Antichrist after the Antichrist has conquered Israel and Egypt and other countries in the Middle East. How do I know that? The chronology, the chronology of verses 41 through 45 indicates that since this passage reveals that the armies from the east and the north oppose Antichrist after he has captured Israel and Egypt, Revelation 16 and Daniel 11, 40 through 45 do not mention Antichrist defeating these armies from Syria and her allies and the armies from the far east led by China, which would suggest which implies that the armies of Antichrist, the Far East and Syria, and her allies will fight each other up to the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, our Lord's statements in Matthew 24, 22, that his second advent will prevent the extinction of the human race, indicates that this final war 
during the last three and a half years would result in the extinction of the human race if it were not for Jesus Christ returning to end this war. Revelation 19.19 19 reveals that the armies during the Armageddon campaign will turn their weapons from facing each other and turn them against Jesus Christ when he returns at his second advent. He will exterminate these armies, Jesus will, and have Antichrist and the false prophet thrown it alive into the lake of fire. Also, Satan will be in prison at this time for a thousand years. So go over to Revelation 19.11. We'll close with this. Go to Revelation 19.11. Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. It's obviously describing our Lord. His eyes are a flame of fire, speaking of judgment, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself, speaking of his, his, his uniqueness. Now again, this is apocalyptic literate language we're talking about, it's figurative language to describe a real person, Jesus Christ, and, who, and what his, his function and role is in the plan of God here. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, meaning he's superior to all the kings of the earth and all the lords of the earth, both in the angelic and the human realm, by the way. Verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. Every area of society. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, the beast being the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, the armies of China, Korea, Japan. Uh, who knows, maybe the United States will be involved. I don't know. Uh, you have uh, Syria. You got Tur uh, you got uh, uh, Pakistan, Iran. You got all these countries involved in this. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him, who sat on his on the horse and against his army. Now this is the picture. You got all these armies fighting Antichrist, fighting the armies of the east in Syria. They're battling in the Middle East, and they're waging war. And they're waging war right up. And then Christ, you know, all the judgments are going down on the earth. God's you know, the, you have tremendous, um, tremain, uh, tremendous changes climatically. Remember, we saw the, uh, uh, the sun and burning people. You're going to see uh, the water, the oceans of the earth, and the streams d contaminated. Uh, you're going to see the, the air is going to be unhealthy. The whole, the whole world is a mess. It's a total disaster because of God's judgments and this war, this, these armies fighting each other. Then, uh, then, then it looks like, and, China, and, and Israel is surrounded. There's, how are they going to survive? The, they're surrounded by all these massive armies, and a small little remnant is in, in Israel, hiding out in the mountains, and a small band of soldiers, uh, Israeli soldiers, are fighting in the city against the Antichrist uh, uh, crowd. And they're holding out, and then the Jews, wherever they are, we're going to trust and see Jesus Christ, and he will orbit the earth with his armies, the angelic armies and the regenerate uh, human beings, th that army, the church involved, and probably Old Testament saints in their resurrection bodies. And they come and they're going to orbit the earth, because it says in Revelation 1, 7, every eye will see him on the earth. Every eye will see him. That couldn't have happened 2,000 years ago. Well, it could have happened if Jesus orbits the earth, but we know what that means today, because that means he could orbit, he's going to orbit the earth, everybody's going to see him. And I got, just as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, that's what Jesus said would be the sign of my coming. You'll, everybody will know who's coming. And instead of just bowing down to him and worshiping him and trusting him and, re, and, re, and repenting of their, their evil behavior, these armies of, led by Antichrist are going to turn their weapons from each other and, and Israel 
and point them at Jesus Christ, and he will destroy them all. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Isn't it interesting? There'll be no war during the millennium. And there's no Satan. Put, see the correlation? Want to know why we're in a mess in the world today? Want to know why there's war? It's ultimately Satan's fault. Because if people obeyed God and did his will, there'd be peace. But there's war because Satan ultimately opposes God, and now there's been war from the, there'd be war in heaven all the way to planet Earth. Satan is defeated, thrown out of heaven, the midway point of the tribulation period, and he's thrown to the earth, and the armies from heaven, led by Jesus Christ, are going to come back planet earth and God's kingdom is in heaven obviously and it's going to be on earth and it's going to be enforced and it will notice the kingdom of God is bodily going to be on this earth see there's a lot of people say a lot of denominations who say and they, it's because they spiritualize when they interpret the scriptures they allegorize and spiritualize and don't take the scriptures literally and they interpret that this kingdom of God is this spiritual thing that's inside you yeah the kingdom of God is manifested in us when we are in fellowship with God, Romans 14, 17. But it's also going to be in bodily form on the earth. We don't see it right now. He's tried di different, uh, God has put, uh, uh, tried to rule, have his kingdom through different, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the kings of Israel. But all of them failed. And he's tried, he's tried to establish his kingdom on earth with Jesus Christ's first advent, but they rejected him and crucified him. And they continue to, God's kingdom is uh, uh, being mediated through the church right now in history, the church age, which will end with the rapture of the church. It began on the day of Pentecost in June of 33 AD. So God's mediating his kingdom through the church at this time. But when the church is raptured, then the kingdom of God, God's going to uh, work through Israel again. And believing Gentiles at, during the tribulation period, many Gentiles will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not everybody will, will uh, get the mark of the beast. And so God will be trying to establish his kingdom on earth, but, and he's been, uh, Satan's been fighting that the whole time throughout human history. Well, at the second advent of Jesus Christ, no more fight. He's totally defeated Satan. God's kingdom will be on the earth, and there'll be no more war for a thousand years. And then as soon as Satan gets released, another war starts, but it's put down quickly. Uh, it's gone and overdone with real quick, uh, and then that's it for Satan, and he's thrown into the lake of fire along with other unregenerate human beings. The kingdom of God, will, is it, what God wants to establish his kingdom on the earth in bodily form, and it will be done in dramatic fashion. And one of the things I can't, I, it's so exciting, it's going to be in dramatic fashion, and we're going to be witness to this. And we're on the good side. We're coming back with him. We're going to witness this tremendous, tremendous display of power. It's going to be nothing like we've ever seen on the face of the earth and now the person who people are mocking today, who ridicule today, who, who ridicule today, and who is a byword in the, in the mouths of many unregenerate people throughout the world, and who is laughed about and scorned and mocked, Jesus Christ and his people are mocked and scorned, those people are going to rule this earth. They hate, they, he, they, he offers everybody now, at this time, through faith in him, a part in this kingdom. To be a member of the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ's millennial kingdom is simple. Is simple. It's simply all you have to do is trust in Jesus Christ as your savior, and you're in the kingdom of God. But if you reject Him, you stay in the kingdom of Satan, and the kingdom of Satan is going to lose. This is what the prophetic word says. So we pay. We be wise to pay heed to what the Bible says, because the Bible has never ever been proven wrong. It's demonstrated itself to be the word inspired word of God through. Through the, first of all, for the fulfillment of prophecy, first of all, mainly. And that tells us that we can trust in the word of God. So believe in Jesus Christ now, otherwise you're under the wrath of God. 
and I know, and, and God sent his son to the cross so you wouldn't have to face the wrath of God. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard and encourage us and rebuke us if necessary, instruct us in righteousness, help us to take these things that we've learned here seriously and become more and more seriously uh, into the word, uh, dedicated to learning and applying the word of God in our daily lives. Help us live our lives in every moment of our lives as if you could come back and your son could come back and uh, take us home, whether it's at our death or the rapture. Help us to be living our lives, being actively uh, uh, serving you in your kingdom on the earth until your son comes back or our death, whichever comes for us. So help us, Father, to be more and more dedicated and respond to this prophetic word that we've had this evening. We thank you for your word and the things you've told us about the future, but help us to take these things seriously. Help us not just to walk out of here and not be affected by what we've learned. Help us to make changes in our lives and our priorities and how we treat people and how we uh, approach your word and prayer. Help us to be more serious about the word and prayer because we know that those who are dedicated uh, spiritual prayer warriors and dedicated to obeying the word of God will be reigning with Christ, for your son, for a thousand years. So in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.